And at this point, he was very paranoid. And why wouldn't he be? I mean, at this point, he's been missing now twice. I mean, you can imagine being so paranoid that wherever you're going to go out for the night, that you're wearing a bulletproof vest. You're gonna wanna watch this one to the end. Welcome or welcome back everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. And make sure to find the clue in today's story and put what it is with the timestamp in the comments. Also, make sure to like this video and let's get this video up to 40 likes. And if you do, I guarantee you a banger will come for you on Friday. So without any further ado as of now, it's time to slip into a mind that's not our own. Let's go. The morning of March 22nd, 1977 was the day that Chuck Morgan dropped two of his daughters off at school and then vanished without a trace. Now, Chuck's wife, Ruth, didn't want to call the police yet. She wanted to, you know, give Chuck the benefit of the doubt, but she was distraught and she had no idea why this would happen. So, after making the rounds of his friends and business associates, she sat down by the phone, certain that Chuck would just call any minute. But, three days passed without a word. Then, just as Ruth was contemplating going to the police at 2 a.m. on the morning of March 26, Ruth woke up to the sound of someone rattling a key in the lock in front of the door. So she went to go check what was going on and found her husband in a disheveled state. I mean, Chuck was missing a shoe and he had this plastic handcuff around one ankle and his hands were bound with a zip tie and he indicated to Ruth that he could not speak, but pointed to a pen and a notepad on the table. In it, he wrote that he had been kidnapped and tortured. And he also wrote that a hallucinogenic drug had been inserted into his throat that might destroy his nervous system. And Ruth, you know, she wanted to call the police and get her husband to a doctor. But Chuck warned her against doing so, saying that it would put her and the girls in danger. And that was enough to scare Ruth into compliance. I mean, she would spend the next two weeks nursing Chuck back to health. And during that time, he regained his speech and filled her in on some of the background to his abduction. He said that he had been working undercover as an agent of the Treasury Department for three years without her knowing. And the people who had taken him had found out. And they would likely have killed him had he not been able to escape. Now, he would not say any more. He actually said, the less you know, the better. And the Chuck Morgan, who had disappeared on March 22nd, had been a laid back, outgoing man. But the Chuck who returned on March 26th was a nervous wreck, jumping at shadows, constantly looking over his shoulder. He started wearing a bulletproof vest and carrying a gun. He felt certain that his abductors would make another attempt at kidnapping him. And this fear was realized two months later when Chuck disappeared again. This time, there was no chance that Ruth would go to the police. Chuck had warned her of the consequences if she did. So nine days had passed by. Nine days without a word for the deeply concerned Ruth. But then there was a call that only deepened this mystery. The caller was a woman and her message was cryptic. She said, Chuck is all right. And then somewhat enigmatically, she added, Excelsiastes 12, one through eight, and then hung up. Now the biblical reference sent Ruth scrambling for the family Bible, flipping through the pages until she found the verses that the woman had alluded to. She was hoping that they might provide some sort of a clue, but it said, men are afraid of a high place and of terrors on the road. Remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed. And that's what the verse read. Now Ruth was left more baffled than ever. And the reassurance 
she'd been given that assurance that Chuck is all right also turned out to be a lie. Because two days later, on June 18th, Chuck's Mercury Cougar was found stranded in the desert, around 40 miles from Tucson, and Chuck just laid beside it, wearing a bulletproof vest, but killed by a single bullet to the back of the head, delivered by his own gun, a 357 Magnum revolver. Also at the scene, Pima County investigators found Chuck's belt buckle with a concealed knife and a holster for the Magnum. And the car also contained several other weapons and a lot of ammunition. What was Chuck preparing for? Interestingly though, a pair of sunglasses rested on the dashboard which Ruth swore did not belong to her husband. And the police also found that the vehicle had been modified so that it could be unlocked via a switch near the rear fender. All of this spoke of a man who had extreme paranoia, a man who had taken extraordinary steps to protect himself from some unknown enemy. But then there were the real oddities found at the crime scene. For example, on the back seat of the car, police found one of Chuck's teeth carefully wrapped up in a white handkerchief. And then pinned inside Chuck's underwear was found a $2 bill with seven Spanish surnames written on it, along with a crudely drawn map of the border area. And the map led to towns of Rubble's Junction in Salas City, places that were at the center of a booming smuggling trade at that time. Also written on the $2 bill was Excelsiatis 12 the same verse that the mysterious female caller had quoted to Ruth. Then there were two arrows pointing to the numbers one and eight within the bill's serial number. Now, no one had any idea what these references might mean, although there were suggestions that they might have Masonic connections. But wait a minute, also gunpowder residue on Chuck Morgan's hand indicated that he had recently fired a weapon, yet his gun, wait for it, you all are going to know what this means. Are you ready? The gun had no fingerprints on it. Plus, crime scene investigators also did not find a single print on the whole car. Someone had done a thorough job of wiping it down. And at that very moment, the police saw a man that was running away and they said, stop. And that's when I turned around and said, I'm just getting information for the story. Make sure to subscribe at Mystery Files and believe it or not, they let me go. The officer said I had good potential or something like that, but he definitely subscribed, so so should you. Okay, there was also more oddities. There was a note found in Chuck's pocket and written in his hand and it provided precise directions to the spot where he was found. Clearly, he'd come here to meet someone, and yet despite indications that Charles Morgan had been lured out into the desert and executed, the police ruled his death a suicide. Despite the absence of fingerprints, the wiped down car and gun, the note with directions, the official verdict was that he had shot himself. Case closed. No reason to dig any deeper. I'll see you guys later. But wait, we're forgetting that there were multiple reasons to question the official ruling. May I proceed? Well, for starters, Chuck Morgan was right-handed, whereas the residue was found on his left hand. And just like that, boom, case closed. Where's my 100,000 subscribers at? Come on, YouTube, I just saw a case, let's go. I mean, is it possible that he could have placed the gun in his wrong hand and twisted his arm in a position where he could fire a bullet at the back of his head? Yes, it was possible. Was it likely? No. I mean, what possible reason could he have for doing that? And even if he did, for some reason, adopt this unusual approach, why were his prints not on the gun? Are we all to believe that he somehow managed to wipe it down as he lay there dying? And if so, why? In situations like this, I like to think of Occam's razor. The simplest answer is probably the truth. But I say no, no, no. Someone else had been there with Chuck. 
We know this not just because of the absence of prints, but also due to the unfamiliar sunglasses found inside his car, and the directions found in his pocket. That brings us to the question of who killed Chuck Morgan, and why. I mean, the obvious answer is that he was killed due to his undercover work. And it is quite possible that the work may have involved informing on organized crime. Morgan had allegedly done escrow work for mobsters in the past. Plus, he had also been subpoenaed to testify before Arizona Attorney General's investigation into illegal activity on the Arizona-Mexico border. Plus, there have also been suggestions that Chuck had dirt on several high-profile individuals in the Tucson area, including politicians and religious leaders. So was Chuck a government agent to begin with? Or was that just a front to cover for his own illicit activities? Well, in the days after his death, a woman contacted the Pima County Sheriff's Department with information and identifying herself only as Green Eyes. She admitted that she was the one who had called Ruth Morgan after Chuck went missing. According to Green Eyes, she'd met Chuck at a Tucson motel shortly before his death. And there is where he gave her a briefcase stuffed with cash, which he said was to buy himself out of a contract with the mob. And just days later, he was dead. Investigators later confirmed that Chuck had indeed stayed at that motel Green Eyes mentioned. So the tip seemed genuine. Ruth Morgan also had a strange encounter in the days following her husband's death. She was visited by two men, claiming to be from the FBI, and they asked if they could search the house and literally tore the place apart. They left without saying whether they had found what they were looking for. But the FBI later denied that the men were agents or that the Bureau had any involvement in this inquiry. And 13 years passed during which the many mysteries surrounding Chuck Morgan remained unsolved. But then, in February 1990, NBC's Unsolved Mysteries flighted an episode about this case, sparking an influx of tip-offs. And one of these tips suggested that Morgan was involved in a large-scale money laundering operation involving large purchases of gold and platinum. And as investigative journalist Don Devereaux probed this lead, he was taken down a rabbit hole and with a cast of characters worthy of the Netflix drama series Ozark. Now the scale of fraud was massive, involving upwards of a billion dollars worth of gold alone. Among the shady characters involved were corrupt CIA agents, exiled Vietnamese government officials, employees of the DOD, and several members of the infamous Bonanno crime family. Morgan's involvement centered on fraudulent real estate deals, and he apparently kept copies of all the illicit transactions. This is probably what the sham FBI agents were looking for. Chuck Morgan probably thought of the paper trail as his insurance policy, and it is likely what got him killed. I mean, lives mean little when this much money is involved. In fact, journalist Don Devereaux might himself have been the target of a mob hit, just for looking into the circumstances of Chuck Morgan's death. This came to light after a peculiar murder that happened right across the street from Devereaux's residence in Phoenix, Arizona. The victim was a man named Doug Johnston, an unassuming graphics designer who was found shot to death in the front seat of his car on the night of May 14, 1990. Johnston had been shot once behind the left ear, with the coroner determining that the gun was at least 12 inches away when the trigger was pulled. And no gun was found at the scene, although investigators did retrieve a 25 caliber bullet casing. But despite this, the death was ruled as a suicide, a finding that has been thoroughly rejected by the dead man's family. Doug Johnston was a happily married man with no reason at all to kill himself. But this is interesting because Johnston was a good physical match for Don Devereaux, and the two men drove similar cars. Is it possible that 
a bumbling hitman mistook one man for the other? Well, Devereaux certainly believes so and says that he has the confirmation from a trusted CIA source. There was a hit out on Devereaux at that time and the killing of Doug Johnson was just a botched job and the bullet was meant for Devereaux. And this wasn't the last death to be linked to this case. A journalist named Dan Casalero ended up dead in his bathtub after he contacted Don Devereaux for information on the Chuck Morgan case. Casalero was researching an in-depth story on the money laundering allegations when he was found in his tub, bled out after his wrist was slashed several times. So police ruled it a suicide. However, Dan Calacero's brother, a medical doctor, rejects this verdict. He says that his brother was incredibly squeamish. He once nearly passed out after having his finger pricked to obtain a droplet of blood for screening. This hardly sounds like the kind of man who would hack through his own wrists. So the Morgan, Johnston, and Calacero cases remain officially on the books as they killed themselves but it seems very unlikely that that's the truth. The mystery of who killed Chuck Morgan and what he was doing in the days that led up to his death and why he was killed still remains a compelling mystery. So tell me right now in the comments, do you think I could now possibly be in danger just for telling this story? Hopefully not, but only time will tell. Also, be sure to comment if this at all reminds you of the show Ozark. That's all I got for you today. I hope you enjoy the story, and if you wish to dive deeper into the subconscious of others' minds, click here, here, here. I'll see you guys later. Peace.